You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. Good morning. It's Thursday, February 5th, and you are listening to The Social Workers live here on WCDB Albany. I'm your host, Eric Hardiman, here with my co-host, Alyssa Lotmore. Welcome back, Alyssa. I'm so excited to be back, especially we have exciting guests today from the School of Social Welfare. Today we have Dawn Knight-Thomas and Samantha Fletcher. They're going to be discussing the gathering meetings, which they created. The gathering series is currently being held at UAlbany School of Social Welfare. The meetings allow them to realistically address issues of racism and discrimination with the social welfare students who need to recognize how their own experiences are shaped by their membership in groups that are defined by race, gender, socioeconomic status, culture, ability, sexual identity, and many more. Dawn is the Assistant Dean for Student Academic Affairs at the School of Social Welfare. She received her bachelor's degree from Syracuse University in International Relations and her MSW from the University at Albany School of Social Welfare in 1997. Sam graduated from the MSW program in 2014 and is presently a PhD student. She's the program coordinator of the New York State Evaluation of the Dwyer Peer-to-Peer Program for Veterans and they are both mothers and I say that fact because it will have a significant relevance during our conversation today. So welcome Sam and Dawn. Thank you Alyssa Thank and you. Eric. Thanks so, for being here. Yeah. Thank you. So we, we've got an exciting topic to talk about today. We're uh, here predominantly to talk about the gathering and the gathering, you know, maybe Dawn, if you could tell us a little bit about the gathering, what it is, why it started, where it came, where the idea came from. Sam and I began meeting last semester, I would say maybe even in, in January of last semester. And um, <laughs> what we started doing was talking about issues related to black males in particular. Um, she has a black son, I have a black son, and I started talking about my concerns about my son going to college. And we just started talking about just the issues in regard to my son going to um, a predominantly white college and just my fear in regard to just him being in that type of environment um, and not having supports in place. Um, we also spoke about Trayvon Martin, um, Michael Brown occurred, and we just, you know, the anger was simmering within. And we decided to do something positive. We decided to do something positive to make a difference. Um, when you have anger and you feel disenfranchised of not what you don't know what to do, but something needs to be done, um, we started talking about social work in the school of social welfare and bringing conversations to students so they can positively um, look within themselves and begin to address um, issues they may have as it pertains to racism and discrimination and people who are different than who they are so that they can become better practitioners. You know, I was at a, uh, a seminar on Tuesday and it was about racial inequities. And one of the slides that they had, um, it was an, an elephant sitting on uh, the stereotypical uh, psychologist's couch and he was crying saying, you know, they pretend like I'm not even there. And it was speaking about race, that sometimes it's that topic that we, we know it's there, we, we can see it, but it sort of shifts. We try to deviate the focus sometimes away from it because we don't want to go there. But it seems like you, you and Sam have both tackle that issue straight on. So what was that like for you to bring up an issue that can be somewhat uncomfortable to talk about? So for us, race is an everyday part of our life because of our families. And it's, I mean, I always say it's a privilege to not have to talk about race because if you are brown in the United States or black or not white, it's, it's not, you will talk about it it always happens so for us it's very natural like don and i that's what like especially last year when we really started getting close a lot of our conversations really centered on race and what to do about it and like she said the anger so it's very natural and i forget that it's not easy for some people to talk about race and we've actually had conversations about that that just because it's easy for us it does make other people very uncomfortable but i think because we are so comfortable talking about it it really brings a level of comfort to everybody else and like especially in the gathering and we're very 
open to no matter what they say. I mean, we're, that's what the purpose is of our group, is that if someone has racist thoughts, they share them very openly. And it's a very comfort, non-judgmental, because you can't, if you don't acknowledge it, you can't change it. And race is one of those things that it's very comfortable not to acknowledge that there's racism in our country, in our communities, in our schools, because as long as we can ignore it, we don't have to take action on it. But once you acknowledge that racism is an issue, then you're, you become responsible. And I, I really like how you say that, but sometimes, if, even sometimes if it's not if we ignore, sometimes if we're just unaware, um, because we always, it's, sometimes it's more blissful to be unaware of the negatives, and then once we realize it, it's sort of that, like, punch in the stomach, that, that punch in the gut feeling, like, oh, now I see it, and now I'm more aware of it, now I notice it, and every day you're trying to process, okay, here is what I'm seeing how do I handle this? Do I do I have some form of action? Do I am I more of a bystander? What mm -hmm. is my role? So how do when you're at the gathering and you're talking about these issues, how do are there some questions from students as to what they should do or how they should process this when they're observing this or now that they're more aware of their own feelings or the feelings of others or the society in general? How do they process that? So so we have had. Um, we have had students who have specifically said, um, like when I go home, you know, my family members make racist comments and I'm very uncomfortable and I don't know how to approach it. So that absolutely comes up and they'll ask for like examples and that's the beauty of the group because we're very diverse group. Um, all races, sexuality, everything. So everyone can jump in to give advice and like say ways that they've handled that situation. So it is very much like a processing group and we all have different ways of handling it. Do you want to touch on that, Don? Yes. And so when we're speaking and we're meeting as a group, um, one of our goals is definitely to be inclusive and allow people to express their own um, experiences. And with that, um, not feeling ashamed or guilty about being truthful about mm -hmm. what's going on or what their thought processes have been, but just being real in regard to, okay, this is the way I'm thinking, this is the way I feel when I see a black male. Um, how am I going to address that within myself? And we've had that conversation as well. Uh, we've spoken about stereotypes with people. Um, what are the stereotypes about your group in regard to their group, who they identify with as their group? Uh, what are your stereotypes about other groups? And just having realistic conversations that don't take place, um, that do get uncomfortable. But with the gathering is really, we've made it a safe place for people to really have those types of conversations. And how do you do that? I mean, you, you call this, you've both called this a group. Is it an open group? Who, who's able to attend? And how do, you, how do you delimit it? How do you ensure that there's safety? And what, what sort of things particularly early on did you do to make sure that folks within the group felt comfortable? We only allowed School of Social Welfare students to attend the group. Um, it began last October. And so um, the students, we posed the question to them, um, would you allow faculty to come or other people um, from outside of social welfare to attend? And they were not comfortable with that at that time. Um, and so we just met together for the entire semester and formed a bond and was able to address issues in a safe environment. And um, I think that's what really allowed the bond mm -hmm. and trust to occur within the group. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you talked about it, it was started back in October. What was covered in the in the fall semester? Did it only focus on race in the fall? But I know the spring semester, it's a, well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. There's a, a few more of the, the isms, as we like to say, you know, the sexisms and what was the focus for the fall semester? In the fall, we felt that it was very important to begin the self-awareness conversations. Who are you? What are your thoughts? What do you think about other groups? And so Sam and I um, facilitated different uh, activities for people and just started that conversation where people began sharing their experiences. Mm. And once that started happening and people started listening to the experience of others, um, 
I think that shifted the group because all of a sudden you're not just reading about something or hearing it on TV. Someone in front of you is ex telling you about their experience, what's happened to them. Uh, we had someone who was um, being followed by the police and he just explained his fear in regard to being followed by the police, what happens to him physically. Um, and emotionally and so um, just having those types of conversations um, really allow people people to hear from people who've gone through these experiences and then to just share their own experiences um, no judgment like Sam said we're very diverse and so people are coming from different worlds I mean you have some folks who have never been around people who are, look different than them they're around people who look like them. They go to church where they go to church. Um, they go to schools where they aren't diverse. And so when they come into an environment that's more diverse, um, they feel very uncomfortable. And so um, we like to deal with all of those issues. We live in a global society. You can't just stay in your very white or very black world today. You have to be able to live in a global society and get along with all types of folks. What, one of the common um, fears, perhaps, that I hear about groups like this is that if, if you open up this can of worms, it's such a big topic, it's such a loaded topic for people that sometimes there's the perception that how do we close it once we open up that can of worms? And I wonder, you know, because I think there's an inherent risk in people sharing these experiences publicly. Uh, and it's it's almost an act of bravery to have these types of conversations. So I wonder if you have any thoughts around how you um, how you frame this, how you structure it in ways that people, you know, really can take that risk, can self disclose, can share their own experiences, but can also learn from others, and and not make it so that you've opened up a you know Pandora's box and then can't close it again. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. And we did, I, I want to say that in the fall, we didn't just talk about race. We have several people in our group who are identify as LGBTQ in that community. We have met people who identify as mentally ill. We have people with different levels of ability. So it literally was everything, not just race in the fall. And the way to make them comfortable, it, it, you're right, they're vulnerable. When you come to the gathering, it is a place of vulnerability. And not everyone has to speak. But one thing we did, we invited BSW, so bachelor level, master level, and PhD level. And it's been very successful mixing that group. And what happens when you open this up are people start to remember, and Don, I want you to talk about what happened with you, kind of your process of going through this. Um, but like students and everyone, it, it brings back memories and it brings back those painful things that have happened to them and they'll think about it. And that's what we'll hear. One thing, Don and I are always available. So we have people who, I mean, this is our community. So people who belong to the gathering, they can come talk to us at any time. And Don's a little more accessible and I know they come to her a lot. Um, but she, uh, but they'll come speak to us about it. And, uh, we'll we'll kind of work it out with them and we check in with each other too because then we're holding whatever their talk you know whatever their pain is we're holding that pain too so we make sure that they're okay before we leave but through the pain comes healing mm -hmm. and once they feel they've been heard and that they they're truly understood which that's what's happened is people are hearing and what's beautiful is our last group i know last semester our last group it was so beautiful to see the students all mixing together and they went off together like black students with white students able students with disabled students i mean like it was amazing to see this mix and that there we're truly a community now um what sam was talking about is when you begin talking about um issues uh, of racism specifically or discrimination what started happening is this is a process for Sam and I as well and so I was speaking to her one day and I said I'm remembering stuff that occurred when I was young I remember being chased out of a park in the Bronx um, and just different things that occurred in my life and so it starts bringing up memories of things but what empowers me is to be able to do the gathering because that's an uh, element for, of change taking place. So I don't have to feel disempowered. Um, and that's part of why we're doing the gathering. So, but definitely thoughts, you start remembering uh, things as well. 
And one thing I w- wanted to comment on before when you said it was about the fall was a lot about that self-reflection and self-awareness. And I know um, after, you know, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Tamar Rice, there was always, I was involved with conversations with people outside the School of Social Welfare. Um, and there was a processing that was going on, this sort of they were sort of torn with how they sh- were supposed to feel and they had sort of um, they weren't really aware of what was going on or the the systematic types of racism that was going on beforehand that maybe led to um, some of the issues uh, that were that were going on so how when you're talking about this self-reflection and self-awareness and people who maybe don't have a group like this to go to how can they begin to process what is going on with with, with society when we see something like eric gardner on the on the news and there's so many different feelings and emotions from all groups outside in, in the in the public community that are having trouble processing what happened well you know, they have the, these um, opinions but it only focuses on that one of Event, not anything that might have led up to that event throughout um, individuals' lives that are leading up to what did occur. Um, so what are some resources for individuals or what are ways that they can start this self-reflective process as they're trying to handle or um, you know, process what goes on in society? One thing that individuals can do is to begin to educate themselves. Um, You have to learn the history of things. Uh, Sam knows the stat in regard to how many, if we want to go back to um, Michael Brown and Trayvon, how many black unarmed men are killed? Um, 21 black men for every one white male. And if you think about the population, how many black people there are compared to white people in the population, that's a really staggering number. And so having those types of stats and seeing what's actually going on, emotion can get into this, definitely. But when you look at the concrete evidence of what's going on and take emotion out of it, then you can see what's right and what's wrong, very plain. And we want all of our, we want everyone to live a, equal life and be able to survive in this world without being concerned about being killed because of the color of their skin or because mm-hmm. someone feels threatened fr- uh, um, about them and they're unarmed. And so, like I said earlier, in regard to my son getting ready to go to a college and just being able to know that he's going to be safe at that college. You know, I've had, my husband has had things happen to him, you know, uh, unspeakable things, you know, and he's just driving. You know, and so I'm very concerned. And um, so I'm trying to be proactive in a number of ways with not just my children, but with the gathering to be Mm -hmm. able to have people to begin talking about these issues. These are folks, school social welfare students are going to be managers. They're going to be the heads of agencies. They're going to be the policy makers. And if they don't get this, then we're going to continue down the same slope dealing with Uh, discrimination and racism and we're not going to get any better this is the 21st century and this is another thing we're just tired of it sick and tired of this we have to make the change we have to become conscious individuals to be able to make these changes so that racism and discrimination does not occur um, in the lives of others or our lives So if you've just tuned in, you're listening to The Social Workers Live, and you've just been listening to Don Knight Thomas and Sam Fletcher, both from the School of Social Welfare on the downtown campus, talking about The Gathering, which is a a monthly group, or it's a group for the School of Social Welfare community on the downtown campus that talks about racism, sexism, other isms in society, and that talks about some of the diversity issues uh, that are really pressing and critical issues, as Don just said. Alyssa? Well, one thing I really like that Dawn just said was we have to know the history. And when you were talking about events that happened in um, your life growing up and your husband's life, and that all adds that all adds up and that causes a certain reaction and response for individuals if that continues to happen to them over and over and over again. So I think it's really important to understand. I think for um, Eric Gardner and, and Michael Brown, we were, people were just looking at that one event. This is what happened right here that day where we don't really know the history of their lives and what sort of what was going on and I mean I know sometimes we have to just look at certain events but I think there's 
definitely a history, as you were saying, of types of racism that could have, that could have been occurring in their lives that would sort of leading up to the event that occurred and the interactions that occurred. And I think when we're talking about these issues, we can't just talk about the day Eric Gardner died and that specific issue. We have to look at the whole issue, the bigger picture, which I think sometimes gets forgotten when we're just focusing so much on this one event, but it's not one event. It's multiple events that happen to many individuals um, throughout society that we sometimes lose focus on, the, the bigger picture. Well, and one thing that you said is like this was one event. And I know some of the things that I heard like around uh, Michael Brown, I heard people make the comment he was a bad kid. Well, A, how do you know that? (laughs) We have no idea really what kind of kid he was. And let's say that he did do something wrong and he broke the law. Was that a death sentence? Did he deserve to be killed for that? And I mean, really looking at the microscope that people of color are put under compared to people, white people basically, in our society. And that's one of the conversations Don and I have all the time because Don will be telling me a story about a friend and she'll say, well, you know, her son was at college and he comes from a good family. And I always say, well, Don, why are you telling me what kind of family he comes from? Why does that matter? And Because she, people make the assumption if it's a kid of color that they're not just a kid. And so there's something wrong with the kid. They're deviant. They're all of these other things. And so you always have to have that precursor there. No, a good kid. And this is what occurred to this good kid. And that, and to me, and I always say, well, does it really matter if he was a bad kid? Does he still deserve whatever happened to him? And I said, you know, that's funny because no one ever says that to me. No one says, well, what kind of family did you come from? <laughs> you know that. Why is there a different standard for why does Dawn have to defend where she comes from or where her kids come from or where her friends come from? Why can't she just tell the story? And why can't it be wrong just because it's wrong? So how do you, I mean, this is an issue then that we have to talk about with with children. And how do you even begin that conversation with a child that there's different sort of rules, there's different maybe expectations, or people are going to look at you a different way. How do you even start to have a conversation like that with a child? That's so funny, because Don and I, I, I want to tell you what I do, and then Don, what Don, have Don tell you what she does, because it's different. My children are adopted. I'm Cherokee, but I look white. My husband is white. My uh, oldest son is black. My middle son is... Um, Cheyenne Arapaho and uh, Mexican and Jamaican and then I have a biracial daughter who's very fair and um, for us the conversation of race started when the adoption conversation starts which is the day they come home which sounds very funny but it starts as babies so I can remember we lived in Oklahoma which is is very racist. The adoption agency that we adopted our kids from, out of 50 families, there were two other families willing to take a full black child. And I say that with air quotes, full black, which, I mean, there's no other way to interpret that than racism. So a black baby's not as good as a white baby. Depending on what shade they are, you'll take them. So it's, they started in racism. My sons are seven months apart because no one else would would adopt them because they're not as worthy as the white baby where I'm from. So anyways, they were four. When, before I moved to New York, my oldest was four, and then I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And it was already, it was very bad in Oklahoma. Everywhere we went, every person stared at us. There were comments, um, there, you know, Confederate flags, the N-word, everything. So you start very early, and I would explain to my kids, because I don't have the racism that Don has had in her his, history, the discrimination against me. So I explained very early that people will not like you because of the way you look, but that's not you. And I would always, I was very externalizing. If someone doesn't like someone because of the way they look, who has the problem there? Is that their problem or is that your problem? And even now as I have teenagers and they're called the N-word and the racism and discussion in our house at least four to seven sometimes 12, 15 times a week, you always are talking about race and analyzing situations to see if they're racist. And it's all about externalization for us is, you know, really externalizing and putting people in their lives that they can relate to like Don and other friends of color. And for my husband and I, what we decided to do and what we did was actually um, 
give concrete information to our children when they were young, starting at about four or five. Um, we always had black history books. Um, we would watch um, Eyes on the Prize and just have those discussions about history with them. Um, when our son was, um, the key is, uh, someone may say, oh my goodness, you're scaring them, how are you? Number one, you have the discussion with your children. So you're explaining what's going on. Number two, we explain to them that we have wonderful white people in our lives who love them, who they love, and so that way they're able to see that the ones who are doing that to black people, um, that's them, but there are also wonderful white people in this world as well, and we have those folks in our lives. And um, when our son was seven years old, um, he was able to, he went somewhere. Oftentimes they're all uh, the only black kids wherever we go. And so he was somewhere and he came home that night and he said, I think I had the racism happen to me, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> the racism. And so we had this, this discussion about it, but what was really interesting was he was able to decipher based on what some kids were saying that it wasn't appropriate and they were making racist comments and just having that conversation. And so recently um, I've spoken to him, he's a senior now in high school, and um, he says he's only had um, racism that he could identify two times um, occur since that time. And so, but what's going to happen is there's a shift that occurs. Once you graduate from high school, you know, your parents can pretty much cover you and, and make sure things don't happen to a certain extent um, through high school. But once you go out into college and the working world, there's a shift. Mm -hmm. And so you start competing on another level with people. And so what um, your parents were able to uh, cover you and just make you safe, you're out in the world now and you have to have your eyes open and recognize the things that are going on before you. And that's when actually I had my first, when I went to college at Syracuse, I've, had some things happen to me there that never happened with me growing up even in New York City. So that's a, I, I like how you said that because I mean, I'm bi a biracial individual, black and white, and you know, perhaps I was very uh, sheltered or somewhat naive um, or unaware. I never really had a lot of those talks with my mother who was, who was white and that's who, who raised me. Um, but I can't remember experiencing um, racism growing up. You know, maybe I said I wasn't aware of it, but do you think it's possible or do you think someone has ever not experienced racism or do you think it's maybe they're just not aware of what occurred because they never had those talks that you had to sort of show how to decipher what is going on or sort of pick up those cues that somebody who wasn't really ta talked or never really was ta had a talk about it might not pick up. Yes, that could be the case where they're not identifying racist acts because they're not aware of what's going on. And so that's why we, with our kids, we talk very tangibly. Uh, my husband speaks about his experiences, uh, the many experiences that he's had, so that that way, you know, it's like you're just keeping all of these things in, they're keeping these things in their mind. So, God forbid, if something happens, they can go back to say, you know what, this was racism or this was discrimination on this act. Even if it has, doesn't have to do with them, it could do, have to do with someone else. And so, um, yeah, that's important. So how do you handle that? So you recognize the racism. What's the processing for an individual after they feel like, okay, this, you know, the racism, as your son said, happened to me. What's, how do you, what's the process of now going back to that place? Like if it happened at school, what's, how do you handle that if that something like that occurs? What are sort of the action steps that one can do if they feel like they've experienced racism, um, especially as a child? What's the processing for them like? It actually has happened um, to my daughter in school, and actually it was a nun who said something very um, inappropriate to, again, it was a predominantly white school that she went to, a Catholic school, and the nun said something because the black kids were sitting together and said something like, oh, isn't that a nice little hood or something very inappropriate. So I called the nun. So it's calling people out on what they say. Mm -hmm. And I had that conversation with her, and my, my daughter was like, Ma, were you mean to the nun? I said, it's not a matter of being mean. What she said was inappropriate, and people need to be called out on their actions. If you say nothing, that means you agree with what's being said and what's being done. 
And so we would all always address, I think throughout their history in school, people would make comments. And so my husband and I would go to the school and we would address it head on with the principal. If we had to go to the superintendent, whoever we had to go to. So you have to address these issues in school. Um, even looking at books, one time, well, I don't want to go there, but just be involved in your child's education. Look at the history books. What are they saying about the people in history? There's a colonel mm -hmm. um, from the South that one of our kids' history books when they were young, they were saying, no, he really wasn't, didn't want to be a Confederate soldier. He was really on the side of the North, no. And it's a famous, I can't think of the name right now. So we approached the school to say, no, this is misinformation. Why are you, look at your history books, see what's going mm -hmm. on, and I'm kind of bearing off. There's so much involved with this, so I'm sorry. It's a loaded topic. There's a lot There's a lot that we could talk about. I think we'll take a quick break. We've been listening to Don Knight Thomas and Sam Fletcher here on the Social Workers Live radio show. If you've just tuned in, we're talking about racism, cultural diversity, um, the gathering, an event, a gr an ongoing group that's being held at the School of Social Welfare. And when we come back, we may talk a little bit more about these issues and also about the role of the university in higher education in starting these conversations conversations and having these conversations since we're located at a university. Uh, but we'll be back in just a minute after this important public service announcement. Oh, oh, all in together now, we can make it better now. Come on, can we do it? Yeah, you know that we can. We're open up. Because we know how to jump. We'll roll it out. Because we know how to stay. We'll cut it down. Because we know what to eat. We'll swap it out. Today's a good day to grab your kids and hang out with them for an hour. Dance, walk, play a sport, or cook a healthy meal. Because just moving a little and eating better every day can help make you and your child healthier. Can we do it? Do yeah, it. you know that we can. We'll ball it up. Because we know how to hoop. We'll mess around. Because we know how to play. We'll drop it down. Drop it down. we know how to dance. We'll veg it up. Veg it up. We do Search We Can online to find doable tips and activities that you can use every day to keep you and your kids healthy. Remember, that's We Can. A message from the Ad Council, HHS, and NIH's We Can program. Welcome back to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. That's right. You're listening to The Social Workers here on WCDB Albany on this snowy February morning. And um, we have a special guest here in our studio, Dawn Knight Thomas from the School of Social Welfare and Sam Fletcher, a doctoral student in the School of Social Welfare. Welcome back, Sam and Dawn. So one of the things we've been talking about, diversity, racism, um, and injustice, essentially, that's going on in our society today. And being that we're housed at a university here at Albany and uh, as, a, as an institution of higher learning. I'm wondering if you guys have some thoughts about the role that universities as community settings, what, what is the role that universities have to really, not just to educate, but to empower, to, uh, you know, to start these conversations? And is there a specific role, uh, you know, maybe you could talk about that, that the university plays in addressing racism? Well, I think the, the first step in that is who's working in the university. I think that the employees, the faculty, the staff, the people um, on the board, I think it, they should be reflective of the student body. Um, I think the students should feel comfortable going to anyone and feel like they're represented in the faculty and staff. That's where I would start. But why is it important to have the faculty or the school involved? Well, I mean, first of all, we're people. <laughs> and I mean, that would be the first start, is that as people, we need to learn to have this global community. We need to learn how to be part of society and really understand where other people are coming from and understand the struggles of other people. And I mean, especially in the School of Social Welfare and social social work one of our core values is the value of social justice and that is the ethic principle that we are to work towards social change with and on behalf of oppressed and vulnerable people and i mean that's one of the things that we're mandated to do as social workers so it's very important to understand the vulnerable and the oppressed people 
it, it also strikes me, it's a, a great answer, Sam. It also strikes me that the, uh, the gathering, this monthly, is it monthly? Is that right? I'm sorry if I... It's um, twice a month. Twice a month. On a Wednesday. Okay. And then once a month on a Monday. We've added Monday because Mondays uh, will be for faculty, students, and staff. Great. Faculty wanted to join as well to have these conversations at the School of Social Welfare. But it strikes me as the role, you know, and maybe you guys can talk about the core mission of, of the gathering, but that part of it is education, but, but it's not the primary purpose, that you're not there to, quote unquote, teach the students and community and uh, university community members who come, but it's more about something beyond teaching. Could you talk about that? What, what, how does it go beyond teaching and the role of the university just to teach? Um, in regard to the gathering, it's going beyond teaching. I always say this is not a workshop. Mm -hmm. This is a life mission. As you as social workers, being aware of who you are, addressing your own issues. We've all grown up in the society and we have these records in our heads. And if we as social workers do not address these issues and if we aren't at the forefront of being able to have these conversations, there's something very wrong. And so with that, we're preparing students. We're preparing um, students to go out into the workforce and being able to have these discussions, being able to be conscious of a diverse workforce. So if you go into an agency and the agency is all white, but most of your clients are of color, there's something wrong with that. So you need to, hopefully the students will be able to see that and make the difference in regard to making a diverse workforce within their agency. And we know these are going to be the future uh, movers and shakers in the world. And so with that, um, we hope that they'll remember the gathering and be able to um, make positive change and be the agents of change that social workers are. So, you know, the, you've spoken a lot about the gathering and this past fall. What are some of the topics that you're going to be hitting on this spring as we're talking about, you know, being this change agent? Uh, it's more about more than race. What are some of the things that you're going to be focusing on this, sp this spring semester? So we've already had one meeting uh, the last week. We had a meeting on bystander intervention. And um, which was fantastic. It was very, it's very much a process with all the students discussing ways in which we can be a bystander in all situations, not just regarding race, but regarding several different issues. Um, and then we have a series that, for Don and I, it was very important to bring people into the school to, to discuss their personal journey. Um, because we feel like when, and we saw this happen in the fall, when you hear from somebody and you hear their struggles, it, it builds empathy within you. And then you start to relate to them and you start to see people as people. And so we're doing a series called A Walk in Your Shoes. And we have some fascinating people coming in. Um, Don, do you want to tell about some of the people? Okay. Um, the first person we're having uh, is Florence Frazier. She's a social worker and community activist. Uh, in the Albany community for many years. And so she's going to come and speak about social work activism and just showing students and sharing with students lessons learned uh, over the years that she's been an activist. Um, I'll walk in your shoes with David Chancy, who uh, will be speaking about gay parenting. Um, he's a father and uh, a wonderful partner of many years. Yeah, David um, is actually a good friend of mine. He and his partner have been together close to 40 years, I mean, 35, 40 years, and they've adopted two boys. Um, wonderful parents, wonderful human being, and he's going to discuss his journey of, you know, being gay, and especially in a time, not that it's particularly safe now, but really in a time when it wasn't safe to, to be gay and come out, and, and their process of adopting and parenting. And also, we have Sonia Rio Glick coming, yes. Glick coming in, and you will hear this name again. This is a phenomenal young woman. Um, she's 17 years old. She has cerebral palsy, and she's making a documentary on ableism. And she's basically showing the other side of people who live with disabilities. When I say that, I mean that she's saying, hey, we're people. <laughs> we may have struggles in one area, but we're people. Treat us like people. And this young lady is unbelievable. She's just, you, you will hear her name again. She is 
incredible the work she's doing and then we are also having james thomas um, racism through the eyes of a, an african-american male and so he'll be speaking about his experiences um, then the last person is sarah, sarah gothier transgendered individuals and then again just allowing folks to come and having the conversation with our students sharing their life experiences so that's tangible for students they can ask questions and just get a true sense of what it's like to walk in the shoes of each of these individuals that we're having um sorry so, so I like that the uh, the byline of sort of walking in the shoes of someone else. So, and you you both have mentioned uh, this notion of personal journeys. I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about your own personal journeys, Sam? You shared a little bit about your um, motherhood and and that journey, but but specifically with the gathering, what what has has anything changed within the two of you since this started? What surprised you about the gathering? Have you learned new things about yourself? And can you talk a little bit about that journey and maybe you know uh, where it's headed as well well yes um, one thing that surprised me was um, starting to talk about I think as a person of color um, you experience racism and in order to just survive in this world and live day to day um, you suppress hmm. those feelings and um, the deeds that are done to you because if you think about all those things on a daily basis that can literally drive you insane and so what's happening now with sharing experiences and hearing experiences in a safe place um, for me it's brought up memories of some of the things that happened to me in the past yeah. and so um, but at this point in my life I'm doing something positive with the gathering to be able to look within um, I guess I'm not well, it's a safe mechanism to address this issue. Sam asked me, um, is this helping you? Is the gathering helping you process what's yeah. happened in the past? And I said, you know, that's, that is a very interesting question. So I said, it's not so much that I guess oh, what's happening is because I'm doing something positive that's helping with the memories of the past hmm. because I'm not just letting it sit inside anymore. And that's what actually started the gathering because we were so angry. I had not, a knot in my stomach every day, just anger. What can be done? What can we do? And so we decided to um, start the gathering. Um, just to be able to make change. And I would imagine there's a, a role modeling process that happens too as, as the two of you and others who are involved in this start to examine their own journeys and start to examine their own processes uh, that other people start to observe that and witness it and change themselves. And you know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that role modeling happens. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'd necessarily, necessarily call it role modeling. Uh, I would say that exactly what Alyssa was talking about earlier, it's processing. And so um, I actually share an office with a, a guy who comes to the gathering. And sometimes we'll, we, we have the gathering on Wednesday and I'll see him on Monday after the weekend. He'll say, you know, I was thinking all weekend about what we talked about. And I went further in it. And, you know, I, I, I went further and was thinking of what we were thinking about other times in my life when he had been the victim of certain things. So, I mean, I guess maybe the role model might be that we're very open to talking about it and that we'll talk about it with anyone at any time. It's, we, talk, we still talk about it all the time. <laughs> um, but um, maybe that's the role modeling, that it's safe, that you know, it's, it's a safe place to talk about it. And anytime you see us in the hall or you come to our office, we'll discuss things with you, whatever that is. Even if it's something that's happened in class, that's the other thing that's happened, is that we're hearing from the students that they are talking more in class, that um, they feel more comfortable, and they kind of have a better way of framing things, and it's helped them to be able to frame things in the classroom. And I think that's something that's important. I mean, I even in, in the social work classes where we talk, it's pretty o an open discussion when you're processing information, you're talking about things like race. But I think sometimes there is a hesitancy to bring it up because you don't want to say something incorrect or that might offend someone. So I think having, I mean, what the gathering seems to be doing is having people feel more comfortable 
and know how to sort of address these topics in a way that is, you know, uh, uh, appropriate. And it's not about not offending people, but it's about having that confidence to be able to say your thoughts and feelings in a way that you feel like you can connect with other people and have other people understand. So am I correct? And it's helping people to be able to talk about these issues in their classes, in their communities, you know, at, at the, in the larger university. Is that something that it's doing? I, that's what we're hearing, is that's what it's doing. And we've even had a, a couple of faculty, faculty members. We had one meeting last semester where the faculty came, and it was really an emergency meeting after the Ferguson verdict came out. And we talked very specifically about race in that meeting. And we had some faculty and staff members come to us and say, I really had always wanted to bring this up in class, but didn't know how. And I was able to continue the discussion because of what we started. So, I mean, it's been very powerful powerful in that way. And I mean, I think it's, we talk about fear. Don and I talk about fear a lot that people who have any ism toward other people, a lot of times that's based in fear, mm -hmm. but that fear also holds people to not wanting to talk about things that are taboo and race can be taboo and LGBTQ can be taboo. All these things are taboo. Yeah, it's, it's always uh, that, oh, I'd rather just avoid it and not go there. <laughs> I mean, I've been, I, I think there's a lot of times that there were issues that could have been discussed even when I was a student, but we didn't go there because we didn't, you know, how do you control, you know, as, as Eric had said, opening that can of worms. Do we really want to do that? And I think it's really um, admirable what you guys are doing. It's something that is, you're putting this issue out there and sort of, giving people the opportunity to talk about it because so many other times no one wants to talk about it it's you know it's just that let's avoid it let's just you know the elephant in the room let's just we know it's there let's just have somebody else do it have somebody else do it somebody else will take you know talk about this issue and no one else does because everyone just keeps pushing it off so i think this whole series is something that is really important because no one else is doing it even though we think they should be as social workers, no one else has really taken that step um, to, or well, very few people, I should say, have really taken that step to address this issue on such a large level. So if you've just tuned in, once again, you're listening to The Social Workers here on WCDB Albany, a live radio talk show where we talk about social work and issues impacting the local, regional, national, and sometimes even international communities. Our special guests today continue to be Don Knight Thomas and Sam Fletcher from the School of Social Welfare, and they've been talking about The Gathering, which is a series of collective conversations going on in the School of Social Welfare about race and diversity. Um, thinking back, you know, a quick question question here that just occurred to me listening to you uh, is that, you know, I've been, I'm a faculty member in the School of Social Welfare and I've been teaching in the school for 13 years. And this is really the first time that I've seen a student and, uh, you know, really a student-led collaborative conversation in a, um, an extended way. It's not just a one-time meeting, but this is an extended conversation that seems to be happening among the students and School of Social Welfare community members. And um, it, it, to me, it's very exciting. I mean, you can think back to the free speech movement in Berkeley and the role of universities in kind of getting students to think about not just to talk about, but to think about how can they change the world and become empowered, become politically engaged, become socially active, become, you know, maybe even activists. And so um, looking out into the future, you know, sort of the future of the gathering, can you, either of you, talk a little bit about ways that you might like to see this go beyond conversation and into some actual change efforts? Well, one thing is, um, we're thinking about in the future expanding the gathering. Um, I've had a couple of people in um, a di couple of different departments. I told them what was going on and they were interested in possibly getting their students involved to come to the gathering. And so Sam and I said for next year we'll look into that and see um, how this year continues to play itself out and maybe we'll open it up to other departments on the downtown campus. Um, the other thing is we um, developed the anti-racism, anti-discrimination statement. And so with that, um, the School of Social Welfare is making a very clear, uh, taking a clear stance in regard to um, 
not accepting uh, racism or discrimination in any form. And it's listing out um, what, what it's standing for as it pertains to even um, becoming involved in the community and uh, becoming allies with folks in the community and involved in different ways. Um, that's another thing that we're going to do. The other, uh, another thing is just being able to keep the conversations going with faculty, staff, and students, and being able to hopefully just continue to move and engage in knowledge and, and continue to learn from one another, which is important. We have to talk, we have to learn from one another, we have to keep compassion uh, within ourselves for others, and I think um, that's what's making the ex uh, gathering exciting. And one other thing that, in, in particular, and in going like into the community, one of the things we've talked about, which probably won't happen this semester, but we've talked about possibly happening in the future, is we want to bring people in the community in and have, we want them to have a say in what they, how they define the problems. How do you define the problems in the community? How would you define the solutions? You know, where do you think we should start? It's starting with young people, older people, just the community members. Like, so for Don and I, we'll talk to anybody that will listen to us. <laughs> and one of the things we've done is a lot of research, and we actually looked at um, Seattle has a wonderful program, uh, particularly to race and discrimination, that they've done a, like a citywide initiative to change um, institutional and structural racism. So that's something we're very interested in in whatever community. And I think that's important with what you were talking about. This has to be ongoing. I mean, a lot of there was a lot of attention to the issue of race after you know there was videos and and, and things uh, caught on camera about you know sort of things involving race in action, and you know then when after a time. It, it doesn't get as much news attention, but it's important to keep it going, this conversation going, just because, you know, things aren't on 24-hour media anymore. It doesn't mean that the issues have just all of a sudden vanished and poof, we're not talking at them anymore. It doesn't exist. And I, I, I think with, with social media and, and all, you know, YouTube and everything that people have a way to show what's going on. And I think this is something that we're going to continue to see um, throughout throughout the upcoming you know year so it has to be addressed because it's not going to go away if we don't if we don't have some sort of action so i like how you're doing this it's a continuing you're talking about next year what we're going to do next year it's not okay there was some issues this year that got news attention we're going to have something this semester next semester you know this academic year you're saying okay next year we're still going to be talking about it but it's still an issue that has to be addressed so that's something i'm i'm glad to know it's going to be continuing and there's an implicit message too in both in your own story about this processing and work that you're doing, quote unquote work, that there's always room for improvement and that this doesn't end and that there's, you know, there is a future, that you have to keep working at these issues and that um, as, as enlightened as any of us might think we are, there's a long ways to go. And I really like that implicit message um, that you're giving about that. So you've been listening to The Social Workers here on WCDB Albany. Again, listening to Dawn Knight Thomas and Sam Fletcher about the gathering series on the downtown campus. The gathering is intended for students, staff, and faculty at the School of Social Welfare, but we've heard that this may be broadening to a larger audience within the community um, in the coming months and, and coming academic year. Uh, we'd like to talk about upcoming events again. Maybe, you know, do you have some dates again and names that you can share with, with the listenership? Don? Well, we spoke about Florence Frazier. Um, she's going to be speaking about social work activism. Um, Sonia Rio Glick, who's in the 12th grade, and she's going to come and speak about uh, persons with disabilities, and she's a powerhouse, like Sam said. And so what we try to do this semester is actually bring people who can, who can speak about their experiences mm. and share their experiences with others. And so um, while we'll still do um, the internal work in regard to going within the self-awareness piece, so when, there, when we don't have guests, we're going to go back to just continuing our own work within um, dealing with our own issues. And this is really and truly the only way you speak about eradicating racism, the only way that we can um, eradicate 
hopefully, um, <laughs> is actually dealing with our stuff. We all have yeah. these records in our mind. You know, stuff pops in your mind. Sometimes you're like, dang, where did that come from? You know, and so you have to work on that. You know, figure out where it came from because we're all in this world and society and we're hearing and getting messages. And so it's just really standing up um, and saying, no, I'm going to become a better person. I'm going to address these issues in my mind. I'm going to be a, um, an ally. I'm going to do bystander interventions teaching students or people what to say when you hear inappropriate comments from people. So we have to take a stand. It, and if you can't do it, just continue to learn and come to the gathering where you can talk and learn at the same time. Now, is there a website? Is there a, a way for folks to get in touch with you? If we have listeners out there that are maybe not involved with the university, not part of the university community, but are interested in either supporting or finding out more about the gathering and about your efforts, uh, how might they get in touch with either of you? Um, email is the best way. Yes. We are not technologically savvy to have a, a website or anything, but perhaps one of our members, our community members, could do that for us. <laughs> um, but I'm at sfletcher at albany.edu. And I am dkt at albany.edu. And another thing we can do here at the Social Workers Radio Show is we can link to you on our Social Workers Radio Show um, webpage, and we can link to your email addresses and to information about upcoming events from the gathering. Alyssa? And also, um, for if, you've, if you want to hear this episode again or you want to uh, share this episode, it will be available on YouTube, on our Facebook page. So don't forget to like us on Facebook, um, on our Twitter page, and also the uh, University at Albany's uh, so School of Social Work website has a certain web page um, dedicated to the radio show with all our past shows. And we can also put um, contact information on there if anyone else is interested in contacting Dawn and Sam and finding out more about uh, the Gathering series and really what they put together on their own. So I'd like to uh, really warmly thank you, uh, Dawn and Sam, both for being on. You've been listening to Dawn Knight Thomas and Sam Fletcher from the School of Social Welfare. And this is the Social Workers Radio Show. I'm Eric Hardiman, and I'm here with Alyssa Lotmore. Uh, we've enjoyed the conversation. It, I, I used the word bravery earlier before, but I really would like to commend both of you for the very, very important work that you're doing in the university community and really sort of, I, I really think, blazing a trail here and kind of leading a way with these conversations that can, can show others and other departments, other units, other universities, other areas of the community how to start conversations like this and how to work toward change. So thank you for being on. Thank you for thank having you. us. We'll be back on the Social Workers Radio Show. We're live the first Thursday of every month at 9 a.m. And we will try to have archived uh, previous recordings of old shows, including this one replayed, hopefully at 9 o'clock every Thursday. But certainly live the first Thursday of the month. Please stay tuned here to WCDB Albany. Thanks for listening.